the, the real vision is how do you create sustainable uh, web institutions that add uh, not just the habitat, but that they have the institutional capacity to support that habitat. And I think you know, what Tim is talking about is a really important uh, piece of that. It's got a governance factor to it, uh, as well as uh, you know the funding piece. So within institutions, we have the the aspect of land uh, tenure, of course, which has been pretty well uh, hammered out in the Colorado Delta with the arrangements between the, the non NGOs and the agencies and the government. Um, then we have to have these long term funding. Well, this whole effort is going to be one of them, where there are relationships between Thera and their restoration texts, or Institute and their restoration texts. Um, and there's an assumption to build, I think there's an assumption that they'll be there for the long term. But the side that is kind of underlying all of this is low money data. Because unfortunately, in the situation that the money collapses, the institutions will follow, and then the habitat will follow. So what we've really been uh, built into is what are we looking at? What's the whole project cost? So there's the tendency of raise funds for the, what's right in front of you, the restoration, which is really tracked. Uh, you get to take sites that's clearly not doing what you want to do. You can make some of it too. Um, so restoration has been the big fund breaking prize uh, for this group of stakeholders. And I think this is really common throughout the US and around the world. Um, the next piece, though, then is really stewardship costs. So, what in the long term do we need to have to make sure that basins don't come back in? That, uh, that, that uh, you don't have uh, people going inside and cutting down the trees in excessive fashion. Um, the combination of factors, especially in sites that have plumbing, that actually Supply water to the site. So there's the water rights acquisitions, there's the actual fees to deliver the water to the site, and then you've got to maintain and manage uh, the, the water arrangements as well as the infrastructure to get the water there. So the combination is then where that upfront restoration cost, which of course varies by project dramatically, um, is, is uh, very commonly less than half of the full life. So what we've done is really then taken a 30-year project like sort of analysis here and looked at what will it take to do that. And rolled all of those different components of sustainability into the definition of the conservation certificate. So that if you are uh, take the, the arrangements, the agreements that uh, the stakeholders will define as kind of being the standard. And you can then say, okay, look, we've got the institutional that we have. We know who's going to be there in the long term. We've got to have a water supply to support this site. Um, and then you go to a funder and say, look, we've got all the pieces in place. We only need to raise the money to actually support that. So then it comes with uh, a dialogue that is not really, if you want to restore the site, you, know, you can take a picture and then please don't come back. Um, to something where there's some confidence. Of course, you can't uh, have people compare the possible outcome, but there's some real confidence that that site will be there in 20 years from now. And you can bring that more sophisticated conversation. The price tag, of course, goes up for the, for the actual conservation, but it's more of a holistic conversation that can uh, promise also the institution in place will be solvent over time. For this is again conceptual design that we've laid out within uh, uh, a, a design manual, maybe we, we call it, uh, that we then are going to be working with partners to really build out the components of over the next year. And the idea is again that we'll end up with some kind of certificate. So that this certificate can be potentially uh, something that, that uh, Branded and then uh, diced up into pieces potentially of the different aspects of funding that go to a project. But you'll know that uh, if once all of the components of the certificate are developed.
reflects or are uh, funded that that site has a lot of uh, high probability of being there. So with this, the users of it, um, we are really needing to target the demand for the computership. Now, um, you know, we've had some conversations where we're going to be working with the uh, Environmental Environment uh, Foundation. Um, he's got a lot of experience uh, talking with private companies on uh, conservation. Um, and so we'll be exploring that. The other side of this is that government funds really do uh, complicatedly find their way into these restoration sites. And one of the ways that we can potentially marry uh, the foundation support and the donors with the uh, US funds that end up in Mexico is potentially to create the upfront habitat and then have the government funds uh, basically supplying the long term sustainability side of that. And then making sure that we've got the governance as, about, um, as well as the government, broad scale governance throughout the region on managing those funds, as well as the individual agreements about the particular restoration. So, with that, I'm definitely happy to discuss the application both domestically and in Mexico. Um, and certainly, we've been uh, working with this in multiple contexts for how it's our working plan. Um, here in Colorado, uh, Wyoming, as well as uh, in uh, Colorado River Delta. Um, I'm just curious how you guys are looking at um, and maybe it's a product of the land ownership, but something that we deal with a lot um, on the West Globe is that we have a private landowner or sometimes even a state agency. And um, you're just kind of guaranteeing the the land use into the future. Like you know, we're putting all this money into investing in this property, but in 20 years, the city might decide to do something else with it. So how does that work into this? Um, and with, I mean, what kind, I guess, what kind of teeth are you having or enforcement or land use goals? And I missed the beginning of the presentation, so if you talked about that, I'm sorry. Um, but if you could go into that a little bit, that would be great. The land tenure part in Colorado uh, River like that again, does, not, does not seem to be one of the major obligations. Certainly, there with the relationship with the government and the NGOs that are in these that are uh, managing these sites. We again have worked a lot domestically with both public lands and uh, important members, large ranchers, some, some farmers as well. And so there are a number of ways to do it. We tend to develop contracts with terms. Uh, it's up to the person. But that's that. Uh, there's defined duration for which there's an expectation of. So, and obviously, you've got to keep them to the back of the box. That's the But a lot of times, we'll work with land owners for a period of decades. So it's still a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Uh, it does not mean it's going to be And then that does open a lot of doors. Yet it's found that way in 50 that you're going to have a lot of On the public land side, we're tackling that right now in the state of Nevada with land with the diagnosis. And then we're really trying to crack it up how you're allowed to uh, do long term conservation on public land. You're allowed to develop a minor transition line and have it there for 50 years. But you're not hearing about the lot of the conversation purposes. Um, so that's really something in the mitigation space where we've got a working plan that is around private land and leases, uh, on uh, public land. 
by the corporation are interested in developing a safer habitat and using that to mitigate impacts. Uh, and so we're really trying to enable them to do that and create that private, private incentive for conservation. So, in, again, there are modulations to imbalance balance uh, contract requirements and then do uh, contract requirements and necessity as well, but I believe we can do that in time soon. Well, I was curious though, is the graph you showed, which is where the top stewards showed the habitat, where there was, I was wondering if that was related to continual purchase of water mines or uh, these sites were not self maintaining or just what was the mechanism that was causing that habitat? Well, let's see, let me uh, be very clear that this is not a actual part of the site development, right? So I can, I can draw this chart for a whole bunch of projects in California and Nevada uh, around Lake Tahoe over a billion dollars in strengths. And a number of the sites include the counties now because they just disappeared from the face of the earth, frankly. So this is something that's a common experience, not something where we have a long enough uh, set of restoration projects in the Colorado River Delta to actually have this. but. Um, the causes of this in general from what we've experienced are really um, that we'll do restoration and, and depending on what it is, but uh, uh, largely invasives and uh, veg management or on the other side just water management, lack of water management is what's going to cause that. Um, in some instances it's encroachment from other land uses. Um, but frankly, uh, I think we we rely in uh, many situations too much on easement to say, okay, well, it's not going to get built on. Well, that's great. That's like really important, obvious part of the equation. But if you don't have somebody out there looking at habitat quality uh, as a component of what they're trying, what they're, they're responsible for maintaining, then that habitat quality itself will decline, even though it's still not developed. We have time for one more question. Yeah. I was, uh, I'm curious, you know, given that you're creating this conservation certificate that is you know, assuring some level of certainty of maintaining you know, the ecological costs, that takes some time to build the credibility around that certificate, I would imagine. So, how, do you, how are you? Uh, how are you marketing your certificate knowing that you won't have the outcomes to prove that credibility for some kind of time? Largely, what we're, we're going to work on that this year, right? So, that's a good question. Um, the assurances that we're able to provide are, are largely um, paper assurances that then you can look at say, oh, okay, I get it, right? I mean, with back to that framework of how that is actually going to build on institutions which are both supported by funding. So the, the institutional frameworks, then you can say, look, without the package of um, certainty that's in the conservation certificate, um, clearly nobody's necessarily going to be there uh, in 10 years from now. But with it, they sign on to the agreement, they sign on to the funding, then they will. So, um, I think there is going to be more of a hands-on explanation until that brand has been built. And so that's something we really do need to find those initial investors. One of the value propositions for the donor or funder or whatever we're going to call it here, and there are many ways that this can be used, including if you take it to its uh, kind of brand extension, would be really conservation finance, private investment realm, um, is to make it easier so they can say, oh, that's that certificate deal that the Colorado River Delta partners are, are are doing. I don't have to think about it anymore. Like, yes, you have this funding, I get it, it's going to be there in 30 years. I don't need to go and scrutinize all the arrangements anymore. So in this current, the near term though, I, we'll see. We'll see who's really going to put up the funding on, you know, to underpin this, uh, these certificates. And uh, 
we'll see how much they want to dig into the details versus kind of say, yeah, well, it's cool, I get it. It depends on the character and the people. All right, thank you very much. Before I introduce our next speaker, I want to thank um, the first set of presenters as well as you, the audience, for bearing with us as we figured out uh, the microphone. I also want to thank the man behind the curtain. This isn't a figure to take. You don't know this. It's literally my colleague Ben is sitting right back here. So I want to thank Ben. introduce uh, my colleague Kristen Jesperson from the Cameras Coalition who will be speaking to us about the Restore Our Rivers 